All right. Well, hey, we, uh, we got a little rain this morning, a little JT. We should be woken up pretty good, right? And uh, man, really glad that you're here. Uh, for those, I've, I've been uh, tra- kind of in travel mode, so I've been away for a few weeks. And so if I haven't gotten to meet you yet, I uh, hope to uh, do that. Whatever campus you're at, I'll be uh, doing some campus tours over the next uh, weeks and months. Um, so I want to welcome those at uh, Sloan Creek and Woodbridge. Got to be there a couple weeks ago, as well as in Espanol. Of course, everybody online. Um, today, we're starting a new series that's a really important one for our church and really important one, I think, for our community. It's called Radiate. And what Radiate is about, it's about influence and how God has given you and me a measure of influence more than we think and in order to make a unique difference in this world. And in a sense, only we can make in the context and the situations and the relationships that he's placed us in. Um, Now, you know, because if you think about really highly influential people and really powerful people, there's probably not a whole lot of people. If I said, hey, how many highly influential, really powerful people are here? Raise your hand. Probably wouldn't get a whole lot of hands, right? I mean, this weekend is the weekend of the Harry wedding. Uh, I mean, Harry, the Prince Harry uh, (laughs) wedding. And uh, who Harry met Sally, right? Or somebody, I don't remember her name, but they got married yesterday. And you think, okay, somebody like that, who may not be powerful, but certainly influential, I mean, how does that person like that influence the world and change the world and, and use that? But what I want us to realize is we're all, we all have to answer that question. Because there, there are people in places and contexts that only you can influence, and that's why God has placed you there. Now, today is a little bit different because uh, in the next weeks, we're going to be focused on our more individually. But today, we're going to be talking corporately corporate influence. When I say corporate, I don't mean business, I mean church. Like we as Christians together, our influence in American culture, the influence of church, the influence of Christianity and culture. And it's an interesting time, isn't it, to talk about that because you and I live in a time, uh, many, most of us here Christians or at least tire kickers uh, looking at Christianity, uh, find ourselves at a time of shrinking influence. So to get us into the conversation, and what is that all about, and what do we do about that, um, I I want us to play a little game, really simple little game, all right? I'm going to put up a brand icon of some well-known brand, and then you just tell me what you think of. Just shout it out, whatever campus you're at, even at home in your living room, in your pajamas or whatever, just (laughs) shout it out, and uh, of what some of the things that you think of when you see a brand like Starbucks. Starbucks. So what do you think? Just... Okay, give me more than coffee. Expensive Expensive coffee, there you go. Uh, Some people say good coffee, some say bad coffee, right? But you know what you're getting when you go into Starbucks. Uh, Don't go in there expecting to get a 50 cent cup of coffee, right? And and, uh, and it's gonna, you know, there's all kinds of things attached to that brand. Red Bull, hyperactive, that's what I said. Yeah, extreme. Uh, Red Bull gives you wings, right? You're, you're, you're kind of edgy, right, if you're a Red Bull kind of person. Um, now, this is uh, Whole Foods. Um, had a little miscommunication with our graphics department on this one. This is the O of Whole Foods. <laughs> but that's okay. I love them. But uh, so Whole Foods, uh, what do you think of when you think of Whole Foods? Amazon. Amazon expensive again. Yeah, organic sustainable, you know, all that. KFC, there you go. Now, now probably there's, these people don't spend a whole lot of time over here, right? Uh, you, you know, if you're looking for healthy and organic and that kind of stuff, you're not going to KFC. Uh, you go to KFC, you know what you get when you go to KFC. You're gonna get a lot of calories. I like it, uh, you know, it's gonna, you, but you know what you're gonna get, right? Speaking of chicken, Chick-fil-A right? Which is just pure awesomeness. That's all you got to know there, right? But, it, but you don't go to Chick-fil-A wondering, I wonder what new thing they have on the menu, you know? Because they, they're not going to have anything new. They never have anything new because that's not their thing. They do a few things and they do it really well and they try to do it with great service, my pleasure and so on. And why change perfection anyway, right? So that's Chick-fil-A. Now let's move on though to uh, think about people in our culture, not you, but people in our culture, American culture. When they think, I don't have an icon for church, but uh, when you think of church, when people in our culture think of church or Christianity or even scarier, this evangelical word, um, 
which is a subset of Christianity, but um, that, that says, hey, you, you come to God through faith in Jesus. Just name some things. What do people think of in our culture right now when they think of Christianity and culture or evangel? All right, yeah, I haven't heard much positive. Um, here's a, in fact, I, I've looked at surveys this week, uh, a lot of where people have asked, these surveys have asked non-church people to describe uh, Christians and culture and church and culture right now. And here's the words that you'll hear. Oppressive, hypocritical, judgmental, narrow, racist, uh, homophobic, angry, arrogant. Now look at that. And you look at that and you think, well, other than that, we're pretty cool, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, we got a few little, di- but still, you know, we're, we're, I think we're awesome, right? No, but you look at that and think, okay, that's, that's a problem. And, and I know, like, because at, at m- many of us are Christians in this room, you're like, that's not who I am. That's not who the people I know. That's not fair, that's, right? There's all kinds of ways we can react to this reality, but this is reality. And you can get angry about it. I mean, that's one way to react and say, well, it's not fair. Media, you know, colors us this way. And they pick uh, people who label themselves Christians and evangelicals who are some of these things and and misbehave and act like everybody. And it's just not right. It's not fair. And, uh, or you can just lament it and think, oh no, what's it going to be like in the future for my kids? Or if you're old enough for my grandkids and, oh man, I'm just so sad about what's happening as, as culture is spinning away uh, from Christianity in many ways. And so you can lament it, you can get angry about it, you can deny it. Or you know what else you can do? You can do something about it. And the Bible actually tells us to. See, Christianity started as a little tiny group of people in a big Roman empire where the Roman government decided they didn't like Christianity because Christians uh, didn't do things like bow to Caesar. And they wanted it stamped out. And the Jewish authorities right there where it started in, in Jerusalem and in Israel wanted it stamped out. And there was a lot of slander and a lot of, and so, uh, and yet Christianity ends up winning the day and taking over the known Roman world. And we're gonna look at that a little bit today. But the Bible, uh, it, you know, like Paul, the Apostle Paul talking to churches and Peter talking to the churches, the early church leaders, talked to the Christians who were maligned in culture to say, you've got to do something about it. Like, here's what it says. This is to those, uh, if you're a young adult, like a millennial, in Titus, this is, Paul singled you out. And he said to operate in a way, to live in a way in the world that we live in, that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. To live with a certain quality that people are like, I don't get what they believe, but sure can't say anything bad about those people. Or in Titus 2.10, at work, to work, when we're at work, to, operate, to live and operate and relate in such a way so that in every way they will make, Christians will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. That we have a responsibility in the way we live to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Peter, talking to Christians in the Roman Empire, said, live such good lives among the pagans. Now, that word is like maybe what your grandmother called you when you were doing something bad. It sounds bad. It just means non-believer. It's become something. It sounds something bad, but it, that's not the way you meant it. Live such good lives among just normal people, non-believing people, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us, meaning because they now know Jesus. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. He's saying, okay, they don't get who we are. They don't understand it. And they're saying malicious things or whatever, but it's our responsibility to live in such a way that just silences that to where people are like, wow, I don't know what they believe, but I sure wouldn't want to live in this world without them. That's, that's what we, that's our responsibility. And so when you look at, at what's happening and how we've kind of lost influence, then it's our privilege and responsibility to say, well, let's do something. Let's gain influence. Let's regain uh, what we're losing. And what we're going to talk about today is how to do that because Jesus Uh, talk to his followers about how to do that. And really, it's just getting back to the brand that we've lost. Because somewhere along the way, a a major segment of the American church made our brand being about being right. It's kind of like, I'm right and you're wrong. And if you don't agree with me, I'm going to yell louder how right I am. And that's not our brand. And, And all that does is produce backlash oppressive and all that kind of stuff. We, you know, arrogant and all that's all that'll do. And that's what's happened. 
And that was never to be our brand in the first place. Do we, have, do we believe in some things that are right? Sure. Do we have truth? You bet. But that's not our brand. That's not what we lead with. That's not how we live in this world. And Jesus told us how to do it. So today we're going to look, go back to Jesus and just into a really significant conversation where he talks to his disciples and he says, guys, this is what you're to be about. Chick-fil-A, you know, my pleasure, good chicken, KFC, you know, lots of calories. But as Christ followers, as my movement, here's what you're going to be about. Here's the conversation in John 13, if you're following with me in a Bible app or Bible. And actually, even before I jump into the passage itself, it's a really important conversation because it's, they call it the Last Supper. Uh, we call it the Last Supper because it's the, it's the time where Jesus is spending with his disciples just before he's going to be arrested, just before he's going to be crucified, just, because, just before he's going to die on the cross for the sins of the world and then be raised from the dead. So this is like his last conversation with the disciples. And John, one of the disciples who was there, devotes four chapters of his book to this one conversation. It's that important. And the heart of that conversation is in John 13, the passage we're going to look at. And then he comes back to it in John 15. Here's what he says. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. The way he says this is really dramatic. I mean, for one, it'd be dramatic because Jesus has been with them for you know, three and a half years, he's given them a lot of instructions. And he know, they know how significant this time is. They know what's about to happen. And he says, guys, I'm giving you a new commandment. And as he fleshes out, he's going to say, and this is what I want you to be known by. This is your thing. So it's a big deal. And even the way he structures it in the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek, is this word for new is not a normal word for new. It means novel, never before seen. I'm going to tell you something you've never heard before from anybody. That's what he's saying. And he also puts this in the very front of the sentence, which in Greek means it just puts a big flashing light around new, novel, never before seen. It's like new, improved, you know, bing, 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 like on those infomercials. You've never heard this before. So they would have been leaning in, like what in the world is he talking about? So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. That's it. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So the new commandment is love people, love each other. Like I've loved you, love each other. Now, if you can imagine that moment, so it's kind of like he, he makes a big deal. It's like, give me a drum roll. Like right there, there you go. And then you know, they're waiting and he says, love each other. And it just went like, wah, wah. Because <laughs> they were like, well, we knew that already. That's not new. I mean, that was the Old Testament talked about that. Jesus talked about it a lot. Jesus, I mean, he talked about loving your enemy. And I mean, that was pretty new. They hadn't heard that much before, but that's it. That's our thing. And we know they just kind of dismissed it because Peter, one of the disciples says, oh, that's cute. Yeah, we'll make some bumper stickers maybe, but what, like, let's, let's talk about something else. And they do. And then he has to return to the heart of his conversation in John 15 and say, no, guys, you're not listening. And so what is new about the new, new commandment? Because they did eventually get it. So what is new about the new commandment? It's how he qualified it. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. What's new about the new commandment is loving people the way Jesus loved people. And we're the movement that he's called into existence, his church, with his message, with his truth for sure. But the way people are gonna be open to that is if... We do this if we love the way Jesus loved. And for three and a half years, they had seen that up close. They'd seen uh, Jesus love people in a way that nobody had ever seen love like that. And that's why the crowds and all the people were around him all the time, because nobody had ever seen anything like that. And he said, that's what I want you to do. And if you do, then the world will know. You'll prove to the world that you're my disciples, meaning that you're legit and that Christianity is legit. In our culture, if we're going to grow and influence, the legitimacy of Christianity hangs on this brand, and that brand is to love with a crazy Jesus kind of love. So what does it look like as his people to love with a crazy Jesus kind of love that then demonstrates the legitimacy of a culture to say, hey, what, what, what's up with you people? So let's think about that a little bit. Two big, thing, two big ways I would summarize, what does the love of Jesus look like? Like what was so different about him? that they had seen. The first one is unconditional acceptance. 
Uh, there's a new book by Bob Goff called Everybody Always. I haven't read it yet. I just bought it, but I love the title of it. And the whole point of that is just what Jesus did is he had a simple rule. You love everybody always. Unconditional acceptance. He, his acceptance was not, hey, you do this and this and this, and then you're in. It was just you're in. I love you. Now, that may seem pretty basic, but nobody ever seen that before. Certainly not in religious settings. Jesus was a rabbi. He was a religious leader. The other religious leaders, the Pharisees and, the, and other people like that, were not like that. Religious people aren't like that. Religious people say, hey, there are standards and there's truth. And if you don't agree and you don't comply, well, we're gonna hold you accountable. You, like you, you've gotta be, you've, there's, a, you, there's a bar of entry here. Like the way the Pharisees related to people, and this is what people had always seen, is if you agree with me and comply in your behavior, then I'll accept you. Because if I accept you and you don't agree and comply, well, it's like I'm agreeing with you. It's like I don't have standards, like I don't have truth, that I don't have obedience. And, and, uh, and that's compromise. It's what it felt like to religious people of Jesus' day and to religious people today too. And that's why the, that's one of the big rubs between Jesus and the Pharisees and the religious people of his day, why they did not understand him and why they, and why they rejected him is because how could he just accept people who didn't agree with truth and who didn't comply. And in fact, read this weekend, uh, well, it's Sunday, so just take some time this afternoon or the evening and read the book of Mark when just skim through it and look at, at this, this little conflict between Jesus and, and his disciples on unconditional acceptance versus, hey, wait a minute. Like one of those stories is early on in Jesus's ministry where he as a rabbi is picking disciples. Now, a, a rabbi like Jesus would have disciples like Jesus did, but they would pick the most like religious, the best of the best, those who complied the best, uh, those who were like the most religious, most knowledgeable people. But you know what? Jesus didn't, he just didn't choose that way. And the greatest example of that is a guy named Matthew. Now, Matthew ended up writing the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, one of the 12 disciples. But Matthew would have been a real shocker for everybody that Jesus would choose him to be one of his disciples because Matthew was a tax collector. Now, that may not seem like a big deal. And if you've been around church, you've heard probably conversations about why tax collectors were hated and rejected. They were the most rejected people in the, in the New Testament world. Um, because it's kind of hard for us to understand that. I mean, the IRS may not be your favorite organization in the world. Um, and you might think, yeah, I probably, you know, don't want to hang around them too much. Or, or, but if you are an IRS agent, um, I just want you to know I love you. And I, I think you're awesome. Uh, I, I don't want to spend time with you outside of church activities, but I think you're awesome. Um, but right, so we don't relate to that. But in that world, they were subjugated by the Roman government. And the Roman government hired people from whatever country they had taken over to represent them and to do taxes. And so therefore, they were seen as traitors. And they were also known to be very corrupt. They could charge as much as they wanted. They just had to send a certain amount to Rome. So these were people who were known to be corrupt, who were traitors. And in that world, if your son or daughter became a tax collector, you would disown them. They were not welcome in your home anymore. They were dead to you. They were not part of your family anymore. You were not welcome in the synagogue anymore, in the places of worship anymore. You were a reject. And Jesus goes up to Matthew, who is a tax collector. And it's not like he was a tax collector 10 years before and had gotten his life together and had a testimony about it and been on a tour speaking to her. It wasn't like that. He was at his tax booth. And Jesus goes right up to him and he says, hey, I want you to be one of my disciples. Like the most rejected person in that culture is like, what? And of course he says, yes. And not only that, that same day, he's like, well, I've got I've to let my friends know. Like, you're, nobody's ever been like you. And so he invites his friends. And if you're a tax collector, your friendship circle is pretty limited in that culture. It's pretty much other tax collectors and then people called sinners. Now, how many people are sinners? Right? Everybody but Jesus. But that's not the way they saw it back then. They, the Pharisees saw themselves as another category. They looked down at sinners. So sinners were people who were religious rejects. So they were tax collectors and prostitutes and people that just were like, yeah, way out there. So he throws a party for his sinner party. And of course Jesus goes. And the Pharisees can't believe it. 
And they get so upset with Jesus, and he goes to a lot of center parties after that. But he gets so upset at Jesus, they get so upset at Jesus, they call him, they, that's where he earns his name, friend of sinners. And they mean it like a dig, like, ooh, you're a friend of sinners, gotcha, ooh. <laughs> but he wore it as a badge of honor. Of course I'm a friend of sinners, that's why I came. I, I came for sinners. I, I, I'm like a doctor, I love sick people. And by the way, you're sick too, you just don't know it. And that's the conversation he has with them, but... But it's that unconditional acceptance that said, hey, I, I don't, you don't have to agree with me or comply before I accept you. The way Jesus related was so different. The way he related was acceptance precedes transformation. It's, hey, come on the journey. It's not that truth and transformation don't matter. They do. There's a place for that. But, it's, it's, but that place for that is not on the front end. I mean, not, yeah, it's, it's basically on the front end, it's unconditional acceptance. I just love you. And whether you ever agree with me or not, I'm still gonna love you. But I'm sure I'm gonna love you enough along the way. I mean, let's join each other on this journey of transformation and truth and God's better way and what he's, what he's communicated to us. Now, the early church picked up on this. And it's one of the reasons the early church grew so quickly because the world had never seen a community of people that diverse and that open and that unconditional before. A grace-oriented community, the world just never seen that, certainly not in a religious environment before. Roman culture was very stratified between rich and poor and citizen and non-citizen and this ethnicity and that ethnicity and citizen or not citizen. Or uh, They had all these different, just we think we're divided and we are. It was way more divided, religious and irreligious. And this religion, that, and the church was just like, hey, you know what? We love everybody always. Well, do you feel like a reject? Do you feel like a champ? It doesn't matter. You're, we're all in the same boat. We're loved by God. And yeah, we're gonna love each other on this journey of transformation, but you're just welcome on this journey. And if you don't believe yet, you can belong here. And if you don't agree with what we're, okay, we love you anyway, and let's just help each other on this journey. That, and the world had never seen that before. And no wonder they began to be so influential as they became the most unconditional, inclusive group of people on the planet, even though they still held the truth. But it's interesting that even though that is, what gave, that is our brand and that's the, what, gave, what makes Christianity unique, a grace-oriented community, a grace-oriented, it is so hard to, to move that direction and to stay there. The gravity for any religious group, any church, any group of Christians, any group of any religion is never toward greater openness and grace and acceptance. It's always toward the other way. That's just, it's just like gravity just takes us the wrong direction. It's why we have to fight so hard as a church. We talk about come as you are and a come as you are church. And a, that is not natural for sinful human beings. I mean, it's really ironic to me. I mean, a great question to ask is why is it so hard for those of us who've been accepted unconditionally to accept others the same way? I mean, it's like God accepts us unconditionally, no bar of acceptance. And then once we get in, we wanna raise the bar and make it exclusive. And why? I mean, they're just so contrary, right? And, and that's why every group of Christians um, in any given culture, in any given era, there will be some group of people they pick on, some category of people they pick on, 2,000 years ago as tax collectors, as like, oh, well, I mean, you can struggle, you can be greedy, you can oppress the poor, you can sleep around in a certain way, you can do all kinds, but if you do that, if you're a tax collector, well, pfft. No, I'm sorry, you can't be, right? And so, the, so groups of people who feel completely rejected and like church is the last place they could go to find acceptance. And I can't go there, that's the last place I could go. Every culture, I mean, we think of tax collectors and think, really? Like that was weird. Those, those people 2,000 years ago, they were kind of stupid too, you know? And, uh, but we have ours. And they would look at ours and say, that's weird, right? 2,000 years later. So what is it for us? Who's the, what's the equivalent of tax collector Tell me, I mean, just what do you think? Who, who are the people, uh, what group of people, categories of people just feel rejected by church? LGBT community, I agree with that. Probably that's the best example right now is the LGBT community. who feel like we hate them, that church is the last place they could possibly go um, to find acceptance, to find warmth, to find whatever, right? I mean, just like, yeah, you can't, can't go there. In fact, uh, there was a, um, in all these surveys I was reading this last week, the one that, that bothered me the most, there's a survey of young millennials, so uh, like 25 and below. 
non-churched people. And they asked them, when you think of Christianity, when you think of church, what do you think of most? 91% in this particular survey, which was a large Barna survey, 91%, nine, one, 91. 91% said, oh yeah, those are the people who are against gay people. They're anti-gay. And it wasn't just anti-gay as a concept. It was like, they hate gay people. That's what that is. That's what church is. That's what Christians are. Now, how tragic is that? With Jesus who founded us would say, hey, I happen to really love gay people. And, uh, and there shouldn't be one group on this planet who feel rejected by me. And so what do we do with that, you know? And I know some people are in there, yeah, but what about truth? I mean, Jesus affirmed, you know, marriage and as between a man and a woman and sex for marriage. I get that. And we're a church that affirms what Jesus affirms. So how do, you know, you, you know so what do, we, what do we do? And you know what we do? We love people. Everybody always, period. So yeah, man, just join the party. And we're gonna affirm we're, what, what Jesus affirmed. And if you never agree with that, we're still gonna love you but we're gonna love you enough to hold that trip. But um, so let me give an illustration. So this, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, our staff did an activity. Um, have you ever heard of a hackathon? Yes, three people, awesome. <laughs> and uh, that's good. I mean, it's okay, look it up sometime, Google it. So a hackathon is like for software developers and, and people like that who do these things where they'll, uh, I mean, lots of things are created that way in Silicon Valley. They'll do these hackathons where uh, developers and other technology people get together around a problem or an opportunity and they'll do it for hours on end and it's a contest and whoever comes up with the best idea gets funded and wins and, and they'll come up with an app or a program or some hack or, I mean, they call it hack, but some thing uh, that's never existed before. So we thought, well, let's do that with social entrepreneurship in the church. And we thought, so in our church, with our staff, we got a talented group of people, 100 staff people or so, so let's get everybody together divide them up, spend two days, divide them up into five groups. At the end, uh, whoever gets the best, whoever has the best idea will get funded. We'll bring the elders uh, together, but the board will vote and decide, yep, let's fund that. We ended up, all the ideas were so good, we're like, let's find a way to fund all of them. But uh, it was hard to pick. But so we, and, and, the, and the theme was surprising people with grace. Because we live in a world where grace is really a shocker, certainly by church, which is crazy because that's the only thing we got is grace. Like that's, that's what makes us unique uh, is grace and, and the kind of Jesus love we're talking about. And, and, uh, but unfortunately, we live in a culture that would be really shocked uh, to find Christians uh, just in, in, in doing what we do. So he said, so how can, we, how can we be Jesus in unexpected places? How can we surprise people with grace? So people are turned loose to do that. A few of the groups came up with the same idea, so that made it easier. Uh, but the idea was how do we take Chase Oaks Mobile? I mean, we work really hard to create a come as you are church in our facilities, in our campuses. And so once people come in to find love and acceptance and, and that, that kind of stuff, and, and, and we, we got to keep working hard at that because gravity is always away from it. But, but we work really hard at that. But how do we get how do we get out there? Like, how do we get that ethos of come as you are and, and great? How do we get it out of our building and, and out there? So the idea that these couple of groups came up with is let's take Chase Oaks Mobile, like get a food truck or an RV or something so that we could go and be present in places and just love people in unexpected places and in surprising ways. And one of the illustrations they use is like, like we could go to a, a pride event, like a gay pride event in town and just show up, uh, not to preach to people, but just to love people and hand out water for free and snacks and stuff and just let them know, hey, we're, we love you. Now I'm listening to this and in my mind, I'm waiting for somebody, because there's a lot of people, somebody to say, well, what about truth or what about what we think about me? I mean, and how could we do? I mean, I was ready for that. So ready for that as communicator, I had my response in my head and it sounded really good. And I was like ready to fire that bullet. Like, and I was almost, it was like, I dare you to say it. Cause I, I really, I know it's sick. It is really like, it's a sick part of me, but I just, I kind of was looking forward to it. 
but I, I didn't have to use the bullet. And, I was, and I've never been more proud of our staff because people were like, you know what, that is a great idea. Because I am 100% convinced if Jesus was in that room, he'd be like, now that's the best idea I've heard out of church in a while. Because this is a group of people that we've sort of picked on that feel completely unloved. And that's a great, I hope you will do that. And, and so, we, yeah, we're gonna figure out a way to fund that one. Um, and to go into... And to, and to be in all kinds of places, okay, and in surprising ways, times of extreme need or, or anything, okay? And, uh, but, but that's the heartbeat that we're talking about. And please understand, I know some of you are like, well, what about truth? There's a, truth is important. And, uh, and so if you are, um, and, and I'm going to ask you a favor, if, if you are, if you are a, in, in the LGBT community, either same-sex attracted or a transgender, which means in your Mind, uh, I mean, you're, you know, biologically you're one gender, but mind and, and heart and all that, another. It's called gender dysphoria. As elders, we read a book last year on understanding gender dysphoria because uh, that's a thing and it's really difficult. And, and we wanted to say, how do we shepherd people well? But we would, we would love to know. Like we get questions from people, can I be here? Can I be in this church? And, and so I would love to uh, listen to you. I would love to hear you. And understand we're a church who affirms uh, you know, marriage uh, between a man and a woman and sex within marriage. So you get what kind of church you're in. But we're also a church that says, hey, you know what? You can, uh, you can belong here before you believe. And even if you never come around, we still love you and still welcome to be on this journey with us, even though you'll know what, we, what we're about and what we'll affirm. But I would love to know from your perspective how we can do all of that better. And I've already talked to people after Friday night and, I, and, uh, and we're trying to figure out how do we do community better and, and what are we calling people to? And, and so hearing your story and hearing your perspective would be, and also how do we help your friends who think that the last place they could ever go is church because they know they'll be found out and rejected and how can we do better than that? Um, and, and outside of that, let's think about how we as Christians Wherever we're at, in school, in our work environments, in our neighborhoods, we should be the most open, most inclusive. We should be the first people who, pass, pass, who crash through barriers that normally divide people, whether that's barriers of race, ethnicity, um, uh, immigration status, um, wealth, disparity, uh, religion, uh, cultural background. We should be the first to cross those barriers with love and acceptance of Jesus. And so how can we do that? Even this summer, how can we do that? Well, the next part of this, we talked about unconditional acceptance, is uncommon sacrifice. Um, here's what Jesus said as he returns in John 15 to the conversation. Hey, love, in this crazy kind of Jesus love that you've just seen for the last three and a half years, um, he says, and this is what it looks like. And he says, guys, you're about to see a picture of what I'm talking about. He says, there's no greater love than to lay, one, lay down one's life for one's friends. Because what is Jesus about to do? He's about to go to the cross. He's about to die on the cross for the sins of the world. He's about to sacrifice everything for people. And he says, guys, that's how I want you to roll. That's your thing. I want you not only un unconditional acceptance, but uncommon sacrifice. I want you not just to care about causes a little bit in a token way. I want you to give your life for people. I, I want you to be so, to, to give your life, give yourself to the poor and those who are oppressed and, and all that, in such a way that people are like, what is your deal? Like, why do you do that? And the early church picked up on this too. And I wish I had time to share all kinds of illustrations from church history, but I don't, because I'll make you late for lubies and you know, get mad, you get out of line. But, um, but, the, but how, that's what separated Christians uh, from non-Christians in the Roman Empire and why they eventually became the most influential force in the Roman world, because they had never seen a group of people so sacrificially loving, like during the plagues. Uh, that's where hospitals came from and collecting people who'd been left behind and finding them and collecting them and caring for them. And many of those Christians got sick and died in the process. Uh, that's why hospitals and churches are still connected to this day. But many of those people survived who were sick and who were cared for. And it just, it changed the whole concept of, man, these people are crazy in a, in a good way. It's what Peter uh, goes on to talk about, we looked at the earlier passage in First Peter. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Like, what makes you, what makes you do what you do? 
that you and I should live in such a way that a watching world says, who does that? Who loves like that? Who sacrifices like that? Like, why, why do you do that? And we should be ready. But do this, even this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Again, it's to guard our influence by living in a way that makes people go, what is your deal? In a positive way, what is your deal? Not like, what's your deal? But what is your deal? Why do you love like that? Why do you sacrifice like that? That should be a, a common question that people ask. And don't, you know, earlier we heard the Justin Timberlake say something, you know, and he says, sometimes the greatest way to say something is to say nothing at all. There is a time to say something. There is a time for truth. But you know when the time is to say something is when people want to hear what you have to say, not when they don't. And the way people will want to hear what they have to say, Jesus is saying, is if we love with a crazy Jesus kind of love that gives legitimacy for people to go, hey, what is your deal? Nobody loves like that. I mean, yeah, I get it. People care about causes a little bit, you know, right now, and it's kind of cool to do that. But you're way beyond that as Christian. Like, what's your deal? It's a great example of that at the Grammys this past year. Um, if you remember the Grammys, a lot of water under the bridge, royal weddings and all kinds of stuff. But, but if you can think back to the Grammys, it was an interesting Grammy year because uh, at, at the Grammys, very concerned about causes and social causes, which is awesome, which is cool. Um, but also very confused. And you could see the confusion in our culture, like at the time, and still is, but at the time, the Me Too movement, really big. So a big part of the Grammys was highlighting uh, women and the treatment of women. But, and so they were trying and, and talking about that, but at the same time, a lot of mixed messages. They were doing performances that objectified women in a really, you know, un-Me Too kind of way. And, and all this was going on. It's like, is anybody else seeing this? And it, it's just awkward because people, we're a culture looking for leadership and just kind of just drifting a little bit. And you could feel that at the Grammys. But there were a couple people that were given leadership. They were basically saying, hey, we need you to lead us forward. And, and the main uh, example of that is a guy named Bono of U2. And they were given a very unique perspective, I mean, a very unique platform, a very unique, basically just say, help us out here. And the ironic thing about that that most people at the Grammys don't know is that the, you know, like, like why, why would Bono get a seat at the table? Well, Bono gets a seat at the table because for the last decades, he's given himself not just to good music, but to causes, to use his influence for the poorest of the poor. Uh, for those in, in Africa who are dying of AIDS or dying of starvation or dying of hunger or those around the world who don't have clean water or unnecessary disease. I mean, for the last decades, that's what his life has been about. And that's why he was given a seat at the table. But the ironic thing is, guess why he is that way? Because of Jesus. And he's a Jesus follower. And, and the way that whole thing started was uh, 30 years ago, he was invited by World Vision, an evangelical Christian organization that serves the poor, to go to Ethiopia. He and his wife went. And they, they went not thinking it'd be that big a deal. They just said, okay, we'll go. And they were, in his own words, they were just wrecked. Their world was wrecked. When he saw, when he saw what he saw there in the poverty and the famine at the time in Ethiopia, he, he, he describes it as all he could do was hold his head in his hands and weep and just sort of cry out these prayers to God, God, this can't exist. In a world where there is so much excess around the world, how can this kind of poverty exist? How can this be? And he knew he couldn't just go back to life as normal as a Jesus follower. Now, I wish he were a little bit more overt about some of the Jesus part of who he is, but you know what? He's already doing the hard part. But I, I watch the Grammys and thinking, okay, if we want a seat at the table as Christians in our culture, we need to learn from that guy. Because our brand, that's, that, that's what Jesus said. That's, that's the way you roll. That's your brand. And if you do, I mean, imagine if we did. Imagine if we made what we're talking about today, unconditional acceptance and, un, and uncommon sacrifice. If that's when, we, if, if we were in another setting of non-church people and we're doing that little brand thing that we did at the beginning and somebody says church and, they, and people started to shout out, Oh man, those people believe weird stuff, but uncommon, unconditional acceptance and uncommon sacrifice. Man, those people love people. Think about the difference that would make. People actually open to what we have to say about life and truth and all that. Um, 
So this summer, let's make it a summer, okay, of uncommon acceptance or unconditional acceptance and uncommon sacrifice. Think about even this week in your neighborhood, in your work, in your school. Man, who can I pursue with love uh, that a lot of people just sort of stay away from because it's uncomfortable? Um, Or how can I amp up my involvement sacrificially for the sake of others, the poor, for example? or whatever cause or need is going on? Uh, How can I be a voice for those who don't have enough of a voice in our culture, for example? Now, if you're involved with one of our partners as a church, let me encourage you to just don't grow weary in well-doing. As a church, let's continue to serve. And if you're serving a little bit, well, serve a little bit more. Just amp it up some. Or find simple ways this, uh, this summer to do that. Here's one example, okay? There's just one example, but I'll tell you a quick story. So, I was going through a drive through fast food drive through restaurant, uh, going through the drive through thing. Guess which one it was? <laughs> yeah, it's Chick-fil-A. And, uh, and I'm there, and there's a person in front of me in line. And one of the things I appreciate about Chick-fil-A is they're fast. They're, you know, the drive through line is fast. So I get there, and guess what? Not fast. Because the wonderful person in front of me is not fast. Uh, they're taking their time. I don't know what they're talking about up there. And she's saying, well, so tell me the history of Chick-fil-A. You know, I mean, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, let me tell you about my own history. I was born in, I mean, I don't know what's going on, but it's that kind of thing where it's taking a long time. I'm thinking, wow, what is going on? And at first, I'm a little bit more godly at the beginning. I'm like, oh, Jesus, please hurry this lady up. <laughs> but, uh, but then that went to, uh, you know, I, I kind of lose the Jesus part of it. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to like, ram her just a little bit or honk or, you know, whatever. So all this going through my mind. I mean, I wouldn't do that, but all that's going through my mind. And uh, so eventually she does turn the corner. And by then there's nobody in front of her, you know, that she has to wait for. So she uh, goes around and gets in the thing. I, I, you know, get behind her and I'm thinking, man, I wonder if she's like ordering this for her whole school or something. And uh, it's just a little bag and gets it. And then she goes away and I still kind of have my attitude. So I drive up to the drive through and, uh, and I, you know, go to, I have my credit card to give to pay. And the person there says, oh, no, you don't have to pay. The person in front of you uh, paid for your meal and just wanted to say, God bless you. <laughs> and, and I felt like, you know, I, less than that, okay? I was like in negative territory. I was like, oh, God, I'm sorry, you know? And, uh, and this may, it may have been one of you, okay? And, and you're awesome. You may need to pick it up a little bit, but you're awesome. And uh, so, <laughs> um, but what that made me think, and maybe this has happened to you before, I don't know. But, you know, we have these uh, Chase Oak stickers uh, to put on your car. And you're like, really? And, a lot of, you know, and they're at the information centers at our campuses. I have not put one on until yesterday, which I know is embarrassing, but I've always felt like if I, have to, if I put one of these on, I have to change my driving habits. And so uh, just, I, I know that's messed up, but anyway, I did put it on yesterday. But what if we, uh, but what if this summer, and I know you can't afford to do, you know, not everybody can afford to do this and none of us probably can afford to do it every time we go through a drive through But, you know, let's say there's, I don't know, 10,000 Chase Oakers. So what if we, this summer, in this area, this whole summer, did what that lady did. It's just pay for the person when you can. I know you can't always do that, but, uh, and you gotta pray they don't order much, but uh, just, <laughs> just pay and just say, God bless you. And, and you're sick, you don't have to make a big statement about Chase Oaks or whatever, but, but imagine if there's 10,000 people driving around with these sticker. I mean, after a while, I'd be like, what is the deal with these people? Like, what, what's going on here? And just one way. If you don't think, that's oh, stupid. Well, come up with your way then. But just come up with a way to, to live this out. And we need God to help us do that. So let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would help us as a church live out the Jesus brand. Uh, we confess, it, it just, gravity always works against us on this. To, uh, to just move from grace to an, an unconditional love to wanting to make it so much more complicated. And, and gravity is always towards self and not towards sacrifice. And so, God, would you help us this summer to defy gravity? Help us as a church corporately and each of us individually just to live out this kind of radical Jesus love that makes people go, what is your deal? In Jesus' name we ask, amen.